clues about uh, to model, in fact, to go back to the original morphology of the uh, background galaxy. The next uh, slide shows you the spectra of each of these galaxies, and as you can see there, for each of the spectra, at least two lines, which are the carbon monoxide lines, which are redshifted, uh, that's high uh, transition lines, rotational transitions of carbon monoxide, but once you have two of these lines, you can easily de de determine the distance. Now, those are highly obscured uh, uh, galaxies, so it's impossible to do it from the optical. And uh, what is also interesting is that all these observations for all of these galaxies was done with, I think, something like 16 antennas and took about 10 minutes of observation time. So it's a fantastic machine to probe the highest in the universe. Now, following that paper, there was another paper that I think is very uh, uh, interesting. Is by the authors simply stacked all the spectra together to obtain that spectra, spectrum, which shows not only CO, but another, a whole series of other lines at a lower level, of course, of intensity, but uh, probing HCO plus, uh, CN, uh, what is it, uh, CN, and uh, etc. So really opening the path to astrochemistry and the Heisen uh, galaxies. And I think that is, uh, to me, the very first example that this is uh, being uh, possible by doing spectral uh, scans and uh, uh, probably uh, uh, in, in the years to come to study the evolution of astrochemistry or the chemistry with uh, with uh, redshift. Another example of, oops, I uh, missed uh, my favorite object. Yeah, I showed it before. Um, is the uh, Einstein ring that I showed a few slides before, uh, SPD81, which is a redshift of uh, uh, 3.04. So corresponding to a age of the universe, which is about, I think, 15% of the current age. And uh, as you see, I mean, the uh, ring was detected and uh, the continuum very well, including the detection of the lens in the foreground, 19 galaxy here, and then uh, in different uh, transitions of CO, and notably also in water, in one of the fundamental water uh, transitions. Um, so once you have that in, uh, from the HST, you know what the characteristics are of the Lensing galaxy, you can model that. And uh, those data which were taken by the science verification uh, 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 of ALMA uh, led to numbers of papers since the data were released, which are really very interesting. And I'll show you a few, I think there are something like 10 papers which have been published since March when the data were released. So the first one is uh, to recompose the uh, structure and the morphology of the background galaxy, both in the continuum and in the CO. And this is, uh, uh, so this is the model, and this is the uh, observed continuum in band six and band seven. You see that they really do a very good job. It's a paper by uh, Diadam. And those, is the, does it, those are images of the reconstructed galaxy in the background. So what you see in the continuum, it's a very sort of disorganized, uh, a galaxy where there are clouds uh, which are sort of uh, falling towards the center here. And what is a, a noteworthy is that you, with the, uh, uh, the beam size of ALMA, uh, you can really resolve individual molecular clouds of about 200 parsecs, uh, which corresponds to the giant molecular clouds in our own galaxy. Uh, in CO, this is the model of CO, and you see that the CO is much more uh, better, it's better organized and you see really a, a very clear rotation pattern in, uh, in, in this galaxy. So recently there was a paper which appeared on the uh, Astro PH, uh, in uh, a big deal journal by a group here in, uh, in Taiwan, led by Wong and Suyu and Matsushita, uh, where they uh, uh, looked at the, uh, essentially they focused on the lens galaxy, HGN, which is detected in the continuum, but not in CO. And by the upper limits of ALMA, and uh, CO, they tried to constrain the innermost mass distribution of the lens. And uh, so this is the spectrum of the HDN here, which is very different than the one uh, from the background source. And uh, this is the lensing galaxy seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. So what uh, they achieved here is to put a limit uh, to uh, constrain to the mass of the black hole, uh, which is uh, bigger than 8.5 of these units, and clearly very deeper uh, observation than needed to further constrain the black hole mass. But I think that technique is very, very promising and interesting because it provides a mean by which you can measure the supermassive black hole masses at cosmic distances directly uh, with uh, uh, modeling uh, the emission uh, both in the continuum and in the molecular gas. 
Uh, finally, an example of the uh, still found uh, redshift uh, detected galaxy with ALMA. It's a beautiful example of a, a collaboration between the VLT and uh, ALMA. The VLT uh, using X Schroeder uh, provided the uh, measurement of redshift, and this is the continuum measured by ALMA. Uh, it's a very weak uh, galaxy in terms of uh, the flash density, but it's a highly evolved galaxy with a sun emission rate of about 10 solar masses per year. Uh, stellar mass of 10 to the 9, and it's dust enriched and has a gas to dust mass, mass ratio, which is close to the Milky Way. So I come back to my previous remarks about a supernova uh, uh, yield and the dust formation, and I think that is sort of the questions that Amba can indeed answer. Let me go quickly about what is happening today and how the future looks like. Uh, since uh, a few days, since last week, the uh, uh, first cycle of observation, cycle three, uh, started. There were a uh, record number of 1,578 proposals submitted. This is the biggest number ever received for ground based and uh, space based uh, uh, telescopes, including ALMA. I mean, it's bigger than the number in cycle two. Uh, there were 184 and 297 proposals uh, which were accepted for A and B, and 180 related proposals for pillar and C. So again, there are at least 36 antennas, but again, we uh, under-promise and over-deliver. We have more antennas, in fact, that we are currently operating than uh, the 36 here. We have uh, seven uh, receivers uh, uh, for uh, uh, offer to the community. The long baselines here. Uh, we do single field interferometry mosaics, uh, spectral nine observations, polarization, and mixed correlator modes. So a huge amount of uh, increase with respect to cycle two, which is a direct consequence of the testing which was made last year to make sure that these things are indeed um, uh, offered to the community and can be used. And this is thanks to the help of uh, the regions where specialists really came to help us to test all these uh, different modes. Uh, the next cycle, cycle four, which will start next year in October, uh, this is still under discussion, but uh, we'll give you an idea about the progress. We're gonna have high frequency resolution linear polarization high frequency resolution differential linear polarization, essentially the Zeeman effect, uh, formerly solar observing, a millimeter of VLBI, certainly at three millimeter and hope at one millimeter as well. We introduced large programs, which will be programs uh, with a time longer than 50 hours for the 12 meter baseline uh, antennas, a standalone uh, compact array, and then the long baselines will be handled as standard, um, uh, standard mode so that in other words, it will be reduced by the pipeline. So of course, ALMA has been built for more than 30 years, and um, as you've seen before, there are still um, receivers which were foreseen in the original project which are not being built. So there is a very active uh, development program which is ongoing, and I don't want to read everything, but just uh, um, uh, uh, note here that uh, the uh, band one uh, uh, work, uh, particularly here done at Taiwan, is making tremendous progress. I heard that there will be the CDR next January, and uh, then its production will probably start very soon after uh, with a delivery to the antennas at ALMA in 2019, if I uh, understood that correctly. The band five is being uh, currently built by, in Europe, and uh, all the antennas will be equipped with band five receivers in 2017. The AMA phase project, which is uh, phasing all the array to be uh, inserted in the network of the VLBI, has been tested successfully uh, over the last month with intercontinental, intercontinental uh, bases between Europe and Chile uh, at one millimeter and also at three millimeter. So we can offer it uh, for the next cycle. And we are currently working with a consortium of the VLBI to make sure that uh, this is uh, put into place in time. So, Clearly, there's a robust development program that will enable ALMA to remain at the forefront of uh, producing transformational science over decades to come. So we are currently in a ramping phase where we left construction and we go gradually to full operations. And uh, let me introduce you, and that will be the end of my talk. Uh, the steady state operations is uh, performance driven and will be defined by the number of hours, the average number of array elements that are offered to antennas, the rate of data uh, processing, and the fraction of proposal offered. So for, for cycle three, 
uh, the total number of uh, array elements in 36 12 meter array plus uh, 10 7 meter and two total towers. So 48 in total. And as you have seen, in fact, we have a greater number than that. For steady state, the idea is to have more and uh, essentially 43 12 meter antennas, 10 7 meter, three total towers, so 56 in total on average. 85% um, so of the array elements will be available at a given time. Uh, as I said before, the anticlimactic winter, which is in February, the observatory shut down for maintenance. Uh, we will do two times eight hours engineering computing blocks per week, and only 10 times of the 10% uh, of the time for continuing optimization and capability expansion of the array, which includes development programs. Looking forward uh, into the future, uh, the full operations will be achieved when. Uh, all that is happening, and essentially, when we uh, have reached steady state and offered in cycle three better capabilities, including solar observing, the longest baseline up to band seven, uh, long baselines at high frequency, the total power in continuum at high frequency, polarization of spectral lines, circular polarization, and repeatable precision observations. So that is a very repeatable and very good calibration. The goal of uh, the JO is to try to reach this by cycle five. And since we are cautious, in fact, uh, we put in the final date for the full operations, not later than cycle seven. So I would say it's in between five and seven when Anna will really reach uh, full operations. And I think this is the end of my talk. Let me thank here, thank here all the Alma partners and the staff that makes it happen. And also thank you very much for your attention. So I have to look in, uh, beyond 30 years. Uh, I mean, my, um, first of all, I mean, uh, let me make a remark. I think uh, ALMA is such a jump forward in terms of capability with respect to all the other interparameters working at millimeter, seven meter wavelengths that exist and exist and are still functional, that it um, is a rare case of a new instrument that produces data that is so astonishing that I think each project delivers uh, results that are surprises. I mean, the quintessential one is HL Tau, but all the other ones, the ring, or I think everybody who receives data uh, has that uh, feeling. And I think it's very rare for a, a new facility to reach that type of uh, surprise level, as we call it now. So it really opens a completely new horizon, and everything that I showed in terms of science is the tip of the iceberg, because with a few exceptions, everything was taken with 16 or 20 or antennas. Now we're functioning with 50. And uh, the capabilities are decoupled. So I think that for the decade to come, I mean, Alma is completely dominating the field. Now, I know from experience that uh, an interpreter is something that you can always upgrade. And uh, I'm pretty sure that over the next 30 years, there will be a lot of technology that will evolve and will enable ALMA to become even more sensitive. I think if you look at the existing instruments that are currently functioning, like the uh, Iran Plasma Devere, is an example of something that evolved over more than 30 years. Uh, it's something which is completely new. Now, if after 30 years, there will be a completely new project called, uh, I don't know what, <laughs> ALMA Plus or whatever, uh, that I don't know. But is it going to be like a bigger size? I mean, so, uh, one thing is when I say that we can improve on ALMA, uh, I mentioned new technologies, receivers, correlator. Uh, you have to realize that ALMA takes a lead time to implement uh, even new technologies so long that by the time you have implemented it, uh, what you have in the antenna is already all technology. I mean, today, the receivers, for instance, are much better receivers. Um, the other possibility is to expand ALMA with more antennas or to have ALMA operating with much longer baselines. Uh, 
uh, not uh, 16 kilometers, but let's say 50, 100, 200, 300. And there's an uh, exercise that in the uh, scientific advisory committee has worked on a future AMA 2030, it's called, that answers your question, with a wish list of that sort of type of things. So the question is how to do it. Hi, Dr. Cox. Uh, I'm actually a senior student at the EECS department. Okay. So I'm curious about uh, when you're talking about future development, you said that there is going to be new tool on data visualization. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what kind of tools you need. And then uh, from the slide, it, it looks like that um, the data is not delivered real time. So I'm curious, is it a challenge on infrastructure or on software? And my last question is that, is there any scientific research done by perhaps a machine learning track instead of a traditional astronomic research method? Thank you. What was the last question? Uh, oh, you mean the third one? Yeah. Yeah, um, is there any type of research that is done by machine learning or data mining instead, instead of a more traditional way? Uh, let me go to, uh, I first answer your last question. Uh, I mean, the, the answer is yes, I think. Oh, wait, yes. Look at this one. So if you look at the, uh, or even that one, if you look at the number of papers which are based on what you call uh, data mining, you see that's a large fraction. It's uh, out of 285, it's 73. And uh, I know that the archive is also being uh, used, although the archive is being populated as we speak. I mean, there's a uh, time before which the data come into the archive. Um, I think also that the AMA data are so incredibly rich that the archive will play a bigger and bigger role over the years. And uh, there, there's enough to eat for everybody in those data. So the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Uh, the archive is an essential uh, piece of, of, of the AMA project. Now, the second uh, uh, question was about the data delivery. Um, there indeed, uh, recently we were a victim of our own success where we produced more data that we could uh, reduce. And uh, it is uh, indeed due to a, a, a bottleneck in the pipeline, particularly uh, concerning the imaging. And so that is being actually worked upon and there is a, a, a plan that uh, will lead, I think, hopefully to a, 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 a resolve of that issue in December where the pipeline will be able to uh, reduce uh, the imaging. But it's a huge amount of effort, and people are working on it currently. Um, otherwise, it was done by hand by the ARC, uh, ARC people, and with a lot of uh, uh, stress on, on, on the people. And the first question was, I'm... Uh, for data visualization. visualization. Hmm? Uh, for data visualization. Ah, uh, okay, so there, I don't, it, it's, a, uh, it's a North American uh, development program. Uh, where they want to have a better visualization of the data in, 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 in CASA and, uh, for the AMA data. And I have to look at my notes here to provide an answer, but I can uh, give you a slide later on if you wish. More questions? I have a super clear or everybody see me? <laughs> Of Okay, I think that's an that's, um, uh, uh, important question. Uh, the first comment I would like to make is uh, uh, on the heels of what I've seen here, there's a lot of effort to bring in new students and uh, by putting together universities and, and, and creating groups. And I think that's certainly the, uh, a very good pass forward, and uh, uh, it's very important to bring the new generation and, and uh, to be able to use AMBA. Um, I think it's also equally important to make sure that the young generation uh, is also able to uh, um, understand what it is really to use an uh, interpreter. So to do it uh, uh, in place, I mean, where the interpreter is, uh, otherwise we may uh, lose the, uh, that sort of knowledge which is very essential. 
and uh, we value, for instance, that uh, it was very essential to have uh, very experienced people for the long baseline campaign, which were people who did work all their life in the two parameters. So that part is also equally important. So I discussed yesterday the possibility to uh, have uh, more visitors and more people coming through uh, Chile, uh, because I'm very concerned and, and very uh, aware as well that it is important for uh, somebody working on that instrument uh, to be able to see it, but also to be able to work with people working on the instrument to understand what the issues are. So uh, that's something that I would like to uh, increase and to strengthen. And uh, as you know, we have recently hired an observatory scientist who is John Carpenter coming from Caltech. And one of his uh, major responsibilities is to uh, sort of increase the scientific life at the JO. What is the interval between, so when this is, Alma is discussed seriously and today, when you actually take it back, and also, uh, do people have an apartment idea how much this whole thing costs? Okay, uh, so the, uh, uh, com the total cost for the construction of Alma amounted to $1.4 billion, if I remember correctly. That's the answer to your second question. And the uh, operating costs uh, in Chile, uh, so on site, are around 40, uh, 41 or $43 million per year. There's also costs uh, uh, across the regions, which amounts to about the same uh, number. Uh, I think Alma was first discussed in the uh, mid 90s or beginning of 90s. And uh, it is a very interesting story <coughs> because it is. Um, the bringing together of three independent uh, projects which were discussed at that time and which were um, projects uh, which uh, were discussed in Japan, in North America, and in Europe. And all wanted to do things which were slightly different. All wanted to do interferometry in millimeter or seven meter, and all wanted to go to Chile. And it's a combination of these three projects that Alma. And so that took uh, 25 years, roughly, but I think successfully so. I'm sorry for uh, this may be a naive question, but perhaps you are the most suitable person to answer. Um, My goodness. <laughs> I won't ask that. Uh, so what limits the functionality or uh, performance of ALMA? I mean, in terms of number of antennas or number of workers, staff, or uh, technology, something. Um, so let me respond to your question with uh, one of the most prominent numbers, which is the number of antennas available for science. So people always say, but why don't you have 66 antennas working at all times? That is uh, sheer impossible to do because uh, there will always be an antenna or two which needs uh, maintenance or issues or it's a receiver or one of the parts of the antenna that doesn't work. So you have to uh, put that into uh, the equation. Uh, there's a, uh, if you move the antennas, the antennas are not available. <laughs> and you may have also, uh, in the years to come, regular overhauls so that you bring the antenna to the OSF, so down at 3,000 meters. So the number uh, of uh, these antennas affected by these various causes changes, of course. And uh, the numbers I gave you are average numbers. Now, the way to do that is uh, you could, I mean, it, it, the functionality is limited by uh, the uh, number of hours per day and the staff. And also the fact that you have to go at 5,000 meters to do the maintenance. Most of the maintenance is done at 5,000 meters which is very difficult. So uh, there are fundamental uh, restrictions uh, that was perhaps not completely perceived 10 years ago when the operations plan was uh, written. And there are many things that uh, is in that operations plan that are in fact realistically not doable simply because uh, people forgot how difficult it is to work at 5,000 meters. Another example is that 
originally it was foreseen to constantly move the antennas and to constantly change the configuration. Now that is also sheer impossible. And so what we're doing now is to change uh, according to the time in the year from compact to very large bullpens. So actually I'm thinking something big here. So <laughs> is it possible to increase antennas like uh, maybe a few hundreds or even thousands? I mean, so uh, it seems like it's limited by uh, person and uh, person, human being. So is it possible to create like a robot? Or <laughs> I'm thinking such a thing. So you mean a robot to, to uh, deplace the antenna, to maintain the antenna? Uh, yes, to maintain it. <laughs> That's for the next project. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to have at 66 antennas all the time, then you need more antennas. And uh, that's the way of doing it. And, and uh, the 66, the number, was a very long debate. I mean, I recall that the very first uh, uh, idea for Alma was to have 75 antennas of Pelagina. And uh, so that was then a great baseline for budgetary considerations. And there was a lot of discussion to know what the exact number was. And there was a memo. Uh, by Mark Holder, I think, which is uh, pointing down, I mean, uh, nailing down that exact number. And 66 was sort of the uh, average which was accepted by everybody. So, sorry. so do you think uh, antenna maintenance will be an issue for square kilometer spring? Uh, or their dishes are very cheap, so? I think that the uh, issue there is uh, very, very uh, different. I mean, uh, as far as I know, they're not movable. <laughs> Uh, they're also probably in environments which are they're less, less complex antennas, and they are in an environment which is easier. Uh, I think that one of the biggest issues down the road is the uh, overhauls and the maintain, maintenance of the antennas uh, in the next year to come, because it, it is a very uh, uh, difficult uh, environment. I mean, uh, it, uh, there is a huge, I mean, the antennas are subjected to huge temperature changes. Uh, there is a, a strong UV radiation, and so, and there can be a lot of wind and ice and things like that. So it, it's not a, a cozy place to be. Okay. Um, can you say a little bit more about uh, director's time and target opportunity capabilities of AMO, and how much time is available for those kinds of programs, and um, how fast can AMO respond to like, unexpected or new events? So there is indeed uh, in the uh, uh, time offered for the community a, a discretionary director's time or directorial time, or DDT is called. Uh, so there is a standing committee whenever you submit to DDT, you can do it in a cycle. The uh, condition is that what you ask for should be also part of the cycle. You cannot ask something which hasn't been offered to the community. But uh, with that provision, uh, everybody can send a DDT, and uh, there are some rules which are um, available on the web. I think the most important one is the urgency, and, uh, and something that has to be done now, and cannot wait for the next cycle. And of course, targets of opportunity are part of this. Uh, so typically, um, the number of uh, the fraction of time that is reserved for DDT is a few percent, up to I think five percent. Um, the uh, success rate is uh, about similar, I think, to what is called the open time. So I would say one out of five or so is accepted. Um, it can be very fast. I mean, I uh, did uh, once uh, a DDT acceptance without even going to the standing committee. I just informed them because it was urgent. Um, so. That, I mean, that possibility does exist. Uh, how fast can it respond to? So typically what I'm trying to do is to have, uh, since by definition the DDT is urgent, uh, I'd like to have the uh, responses back from the standing committee within two weeks. Well, how fast can Alma schedule? So then it depends on what it is, but once it's accepted, it schedules whenever it can, um, with a priority, uh, a priority. Could you comment on the, uh, the protection of the D-meta with the catalytic 